Okay, so we have the vehicle's speed, the launch window, and for argument's sake, the landing zone is the Bahamas. Should be enough to figure the go, no go? Yeah, in theory, sir. We need to be past theory at this point. We'll be able to calculate a go, no go with that information. When exactly is that gonna happen? <laughs> Catherine, have a go at it. The goal point for re-entry is 2,990 miles from where we want Colonel Glenn to land. If we assume that's the Bahamas, it's 17,544 miles per hour. Upon re-entry, 370 feet at a descent angle of 46.56 degrees distance Velocity squared, sun, gravity squared, sun, 32 feet, and the distance would be 20 million, 500, feet, or 2,990 miles, or 46, Point three three degrees. Okay, so that puts your landing zone at 5.0667 degrees north, 77.3333 degrees west, which is here. Right here. Give or take 20 square miles. I like your numbers. <laughs> Thank you. So we're in a series on assurance. And um, it occurs to me that I'm probably not doing this series for you. I mean, honestly, I, I thought about this. Uh, this is why I haven't done a series like this in, in quite a while. Because I think you generally hear this and you if you've been attending this church for any length of time you put these things together but i am blown away at how many people that don't attend our church that listen to my messages i'm also blown away at the need in christendom and the need in dare i say evangelical christendom because you would think evangelicals you know we we, we kind of in the same place in the room but i'm blown away at how many quote unquote evangelicals, the subject I'm talking about is completely foreign to them. And to me, it's, it's the most basic of topics that we can talk about. And so uh, just as a review, last, the last two weeks or three, three weeks we've been in this, and we were in John 1, the woman at the well, and we were talking about the first week, the water, her need was the water, and the disciples' need was the food. And what we end up doing is we end up getting that confused. And when we end up getting that confused in a theological sense, some bad things can happen. Some bad things can happen as far as our, uh, our, our understanding of, of why we're connected to God or how we're connected to God. Uh, and it can be a simple mistake, but it can be, at best case, embarrassing or funny, and at worst case, tragic. And just you can have your life sucked out of you. I remember one time I had a friend of mine named Marshall, Marshall Eisenhower. He's no longer with us. And um, Marshall and I had not known each other very long, and this would have been in 1999. And uh, he came over to my house for the first time. So we have four kids in our house. And let me just say we live in our house. We, our, our house is pretty well lived in. Let me put it this way. You, you don't walk in our house, especially when we had four kids in the house, and say, I wonder if anybody lives here. 
No, you can say that. So Marshall, I said, come on in, Marshall. Come on in, Marshall. And as I'm bringing him in the living room, I said, I, many of you know my firstborn, who's at this time 10 years old. He's, he's in there. And, and I say, Marshall, pick up those underwear. Marshall, pick up those tiles. Get this stuff. This, my, and, and I'm making my way. And I look around, and here's Marshall Eisenhower holding a pair of underwear. <laughs> yeah, I missed it by that much. Now, did I want Marshall Eisenhower to pick up laundry that had not been put away? I wanted my Marshall, 10-year-old Marshall. I'm trying to impress Big Marshall, and so I'm trying to get it cleaned up, you know, while get it cleaned up. And, and yet, when I'm just saying, Marshall, do this, and Marshall, do, you know, he, okay, I guess I came over here to help Rod clean up the house. And that's funny, but the, the problem is sometimes when we read Scripture, people misread the Scripture. Pe- people don't realize who that passage is written to. So in John, it's written to people that are unbelievers. It's written to all, everybody. And so in the first two messages, we looked at the food and the water. How the water was the, the, it's what the woman needed And Jesus gives to her, shares to her the message of life, that he is the Christ. The food, the harvest, it's what the the disciples needed. And then we looked at the medium, the confusion that can happen between the the way the message gets out, the medium of the message, and the message itself. There can be a confusion of that. And may I highly recommend our podcast from last week, because in there I trace through a lot of things that happen in Scripture, that's humanity's bend. Humanity's bend is toward the physical, the tangible, and we do it all the time. And so it's very easy to see how we can swap the message for the method we get the message. So today I've titled this uh, The Logic of Assurance, and we're going to just do a head trip, The Logic of Assurance. And first, I want to get some basics down. This, this is basic. This is fundamental. But it's kind of like when, I, when I, you, know, you go out for basketball or baseball uh, you know, in, in high school. I never did that in college. But when you go out for that and you're running for three days, you know, the coach says, this is, this is basic. You got to run. If you, I don't want to run. You got to run. And, and then they say, this is a ball. This is a ball. You know, I mean, literally, my high school coach said, here are the, here's the line. This is out of bounds right here. This is in bounds. This is out of bounds. The basics. That's where we're going to go. And here's the basics I, w- I want to show you right here. Of assurance basics. We need to know our side and God's side. Our side and God's side. I'll tell you, uh, Brian Hedrick and I would play golf. And we'd play golf. He's, a, he's just retired uh, from Elon, but... Uh, I would play with some Elon professors. We'd go play golf. And after a round of golf, inevitably, Brian would say this, let's go do something we're good at, which is eat. Might not can play golf, but we can eat. So when we're looking at these assurance uh, uh, basics, let's look at what we're good at, and let's look at what God's good at, okay? So on my side, what am I good at? I'm good at sinning. I magna cum laude, summa cum laude. I'm real good at that. Even when I do something good, I'm good at ascribing motives to it that, under, that undermines the good that I do. I'm, I'm fantastic at sinning. Now, what's God's good at? Well, let's look at God's. He's good at saving. You say, Rod, this is it's a little embarrassing. Is it? Because oftentimes we think we're pretty good at saving. And and if we just logically work this from the other side, how good is God at sinning? He can't do it. He can't do it. He cannot sin. How good am I at saving? I can't do it. And it's very interesting. We're going to look at some... some, uh, theologians that I love, that are popular, that have encouraged you, and we're going to look at some of their understandings, and inevitably, here's what they end up doing. They don't realize it, but they end up saying, you know, God might not be good at sinning, 
But he can sure overlook it, at least depending on the type of sin. And I might not be so great at saving, but at least I can help it. You've got to keep these two things separate. Realize I'm good at sinning, and God's good at savings. Now, lest you think, oh, Rod, you're a good guy. You're from the South. You're you're a good guy. Okay, I will admit I might not be the chief among sinners. I might not be. But I want to introduce you to the one who said he was the chief among sinners. Let's look at him. Let's look at 1 Timothy. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Everybody should accept what this writer, who's the Apostle Paul, is getting ready to say. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So the Apostle Paul, if he were standing up here, he would say, you know, we would go, he's holy. Paul would say, no, 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 no. I'm the worst sinner. And and there would be a fight breaking out. Oh, well, I'm worse than you. No, no, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. So he says, "This this is a saying that needs to be accepted. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, and I'm the worst. But for that very reason, because I was the worst, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his immense patience, being patient with everyone as an example for those who would believe in him. There's that word we've been coming across, that phrase, believing in him, and receive eternal life. Can they believe in him without receiving eternal life? Apostle Paul doesn't think so. He says, so so they can believe in him, and by believing him, they automatically receive eternal life. So the worst of sinners acknowledges that, and he says the reason how he can say that is because Jesus loves saving, loves saving the worst of sinners. Okay, so we got that. We got that. So let's go... um, Let's go into uh, this this whole concept of of Jesus or why Jesus or or the evidence for Jesus or the the priority of Jesus. Let's go back and let's look at the next chapter in the book of John from what we have covered before, John chapter 5. Jesus is talking to some religious people. They think they've got a handle on this because they have studied Scripture. They have searched. It's their life. It's their world. They they know the scriptures back and forth. And here's what Jesus uh, says in John chapter 5. We'll look at verse 24 and then we're going to skip down. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Has. Got it? Has is real important there. Has eternal life. If you, if you believe him who sent me, you, you, he has eternal life and will not be judged. Not hopefully won't be judged, but will not. Not should not be judged, but will not be judged, but has crossed. And again, that word has. It's already happened. The person that believes in Christ has crossed over from death to life. When does this crossover ha- occur? When one believes Jesus. When one believes in Jesus. One believes in him because he's been sent from the Father. Now, what's the evidence? And remember, he's talking to religious people. He's talking to religious Jews. What's the evidence that this is the case? How do we know Jesus is the one sent from God? He goes down in verse 33. He says, You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mentioned it that you might be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his life, his light. What he's talking about here is John the Baptist. You you are mesmerized by John the Baptist. 
And what did John do? John pointed to me. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The same could be true of the, the apostles. They had seen, the ones that were with Jesus, had seen him do these miraculous works. Surely the, the rumor mill was going, hey, I was with him, I saw this. He's saying to the religious leaders, you have the testimony of others. In fact, these, the testimony that you have, these are people you've interacted with. You sat under their teaching. You, you wrestled with their concepts and what they said. You wrestled with what John the Baptist said. You enjoyed their light. In fact, you were encouraged by it. You knew that when you closed the door to your room at night and you looked in the mirror, the fact of the matter is you knew what they were saying was true. You knew it. And that, yet, you ignore who I am, even though their message aligns with me. Then he goes on, and he says this, I have testimony weightier than that of John. You, you, you want more testimony? I've got that that's weightier than John or any of the apostles. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. He said, look, look, look at the works. Look, look at what I'm doing. He just healed a guy. Look at, look at what I'm doing. That's what you've got to wrestle with. This is a truth you've got to deal with. It doesn't matter if you're religion, religious or not. You've got to deal with this truth. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You were there when you heard the voice of heaven. God spoke. It's not only the, John's testimony. It's not only my works. It's not only God's voice. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. I'll read that again. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You don't believe me. He, he sent me, and you don't believe it. And then lastly, the fourth reason he gives is this. He says, you study the Scriptures diligently. We're coming into your ballpark now. We're going to talk about something that you're a professional with. You search the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Just searching the Scriptures, you think that will give you eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to do what? To come to me. Because if you came to me, you would have life. And so by not coming to me, you refuse to have life. Okay, so I want to, I want to talk a, a little bit. I want to, now that we, we know that Jesus is the one, he's got the testimony of, of others, he's got the testimony of God, he's got his works, he's got the Old Testament scriptures. He's the one. What are we going to do with him? I want us to logically think through this in terms of a syllogism. Now, typically, you know, when first year, in college, you philosophy course, you do this syllogism. Uh, all men are mortal. The first premise, the true premise, state that fact. Socrates is a man, second premise. And then you have a conclusion. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Okay, it's, it's logic. It, it flows like that. I want to give you the obvious syllogism for assurance. This is obvious. Everybody knows this, okay? Everybody knows this. Let's look at it. The obvious syllogism is this. It's what everybody knows. Open a book written by just about anybody, they know this. Christians don't sin. Christians don't smoke or chew or go with girls that do. It's usually Christians don't, okay? Now, the second part of that, because that's a fact, right? It's a fact. I sin, I steal, I cheat. Therefore, I am not a Christian. Now, everybody knows this. It's very clear what Christians do and what Christians don't do. Christians love everybody. If you followed me around for a little while, you would see I don't love everybody. Therefore, I must not be a Christian. Let's say that I... I I don't sin. And I can say, I don't sin so far. 
Let's say I don't steal. I haven't stolen anything so far. Let's say I, I, I've never cheated. I, I don't cheat so far. Because right now with this obvious syllogism, you, you can get to a point where you say, you know, I'm okay right now, but can you guarantee you're going to be okay later? And what happens when you get in your own little private field? Baptists don't dance. I dance. Therefore, I'm not a Baptist. <laughs> you could say it this way. Regenerated people don't whatever. Fill in the blank. Whatever you want your private sin to be. It can be anything. And then, ask yourself, do you do that? Well, if you do that, then the logic is, therefore, you must not be a Christian. i got to tell you, 90 plus percent of evangelicals believe this right here. Oh, Rod, hear me. The things I'm going to show you in the next few weeks are going to blow your mind. Let, let me just ask you something. For your dads out here, for the dads, I'm sorry, moms, but for the dads, you'll see moms, it'll apply to you as well. Dads, what would it be like for you to be behind one of those mirrors, you know, kind of one-way mirrors, maybe in a police station or somewhere, and I have your child in there, and I'm asking your child questions, and I ask your child things, and, and, and your child says, I never knew if my dad loved me or not. I never knew if my dad accepted me or not. I never knew if I was good enough for my dad or not. Do you feel it? You feel it right here? The horrible feeling that your child would for a nanosecond doubt your love for them. And yet somehow we think God is okay with us doubting his love for us. We think that's perfectly right. Sure. This, while it's practical and it's obvious, it's also wrong. Okay? It's wrong. That's not the way you get assurance. Because what are you looking at? You're looking at what you do. And we've already established in the first slide that we're real good at sinning. We got the sin down. Okay? And he's good at saving. Now, let's go to a story in the Bible in, that, that Allison read uh, this morning. The, the story, it's the Lazarus. It's, it's Lazarus' sister, Martha. And here's Here's the verse. Jesus said to her, I'm, I'm truncating this story. I'm giving you this, this section. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. The one who believes in me will live. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now, he's talking about living physically again. Lazarus has died. And whoever lives... How does he live? By believing in me, will never die. Spiritually, will never die. And then he asks a question Do you believe this? And here's Martha's answer Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. All right, let's break this down as a syllogism. This is the assurance syllogism. Let's throw that up. Yeah, the assurance syllogism. Whoever believes in Jesus has everlasting life. Well, your response to that would, might be, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus. I, don't, I should have a slide that says, I don't believe. Anyway, therefore, I don't have everlasting life. It's... Is the first statement true? Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Yes, it's a fact. It's true. Then it comes down, does a person believe or not believe? I, I, I don't, they might, Martha could have said, I don't know if I believe. Well, therefore, I don't know if I have everlasting life. I don't know. Let's go, <clears throat> next slide. Jesus says, whoever believes in Jesus has everlasting life. And Martha says, I believe. 
Therefore, what can we deduce from that? I have everlasting life. Yeah, but, 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 but what about? What, what, what about? What about? Assurance of salvation is based on believing Jesus for it. It's, belie- it's, it's based on the promise that Jesus has made to you. You already have John's testimony. You already have God's testimony. You already have the Word of God. You have already have Christ's work. He rose from the dead. You either believe Him for it or you don't. Because we're real good at sinning and He's real good at saving. Now, I want us to look at some false examples. Some, some people... Some, some people have, some people feel like they're saved. Yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. Why? And here's what the, God will save everyone baptized as a child. I was baptized as a child. Therefore, I will be saved. There are some people that just, they are assured they're going to heaven. Why? Because they were baptized as a child. Here's the question. Is the premise true? Is the premise true that God will save everyone baptized as a child? And if you think that's true, where is that found in Scripture? Or is that part of church doctrine? Whatever church, whatever background you're from. See, we, we we can do this all day long. I can take you to churches that have Jesus all over and say, look, if you do this, then you will be saved. You will be regenerated. And everybody has their own thing, whatever that is. So some people are assured, but that assurance is false assurance because it's based on a faulty premise. It's based on truth that's not true. It's based on something that's not found in the Word of God. Let me tell you what I'm going to do with this series. I I, I hadn't found anybody that, 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 that does this, and I just had my paper, and I was just writing out things one of the sermons I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the Bible verses that teach that you can't be sure. Rod, if what you're saying is true, how come there are preachers I know, there are churches, there are friends of ours that teach something different? And, and, and they say it's from the Word of God. We're going to look right at the Word of God. We're going to see. We're going to, we're going to ask, does the Bible teach another way that you can be saved or does the Bible teach that you can't be sure we're going to look at that I just that's one of the things I wrote down now sometimes we base our assurance based on emotion look look, here's another false assurance whoever gets emotional about God is saved I get emotional about God therefore I must be saved well I went and they were having revival and I was jumping up and down and I was shaking and and therefore I must be saved but the scripture teaches if you get emotional about God. Whoever has a, a, a specific gift of utterances or a stat will be saved. I, I have that gift, therefore I'm saved. That's not what the word teaches. And what's happening is people base their assurance on something that's completely false. It's like chaff that's blown away. You base your assurance on what Christ offers you. It's it's Christ's gift to give because he's real good at saving and we're real good at sinning. And here's alert. After we come to him, we still are pretty good at sinning. When does he say the eternal life begins? He has eternal life. He has passed from death to life. It happens the moment we believe in him for it. The moment we believe in him for it. The movie clip, Hidden Figures. If you haven't seen it, you ought to see it. It's about the space program, the early years. Now, if you look, I, I always, when I see a good movie like that, I always look, all right, what's fact and what's fiction? How did, how did they embellish it? And there were some embellishments, things that didn't happen, they say that happened. But the scene you saw pretty much happened like that. There's men in the room just men and they're trying to figure out 
when John Glenn is launched into space, where is he going to land? It's just me. And Catherine needs to come in the room. She says she cannot do her work unless she's in the room. <laughs> now, this is like, you know, in early, early, early 60s. Now, you might think the first problem is she's black. That ain't the first problem. The first problem is she's a woman. We don't allow women in here. And so she comes in that room, and the guy says, wait a minute. This room don't look like it's normally looked. I have not seen a skirt in here. And they're looking. They ask the question. Nobody raises anything, but it's obvious. This, this room is not familiar. And hand over to do the math. She goes up. She does the math. And then John Glenn says this. I like her numbers. He doesn't say, I like her. He doesn't say, I think she's pretty or I don't think she's pretty. Because it's got nothing to do with her. It's about the numbers. It's about the fact. It's about the logic. And you know why he says that? Because he's the one that's got to go up. He's the one that's putting his trust in her hands. It's those numbers. Those numbers have to work. And if you want assurance of salvation, the fact of the matter is the numbers have to work. And the only way the numbers work is that you understand that Jesus came to give you life. And the only way the numbers work for your friends is that they understand that Jesus came to give them life. But, but, but Rod, they're good. I, I understand they're good. That's great. We need a lot of good people. Rod, they're religious. I understand. That's, that's wonderful. They're, they're religious. In John chapter 5, Jesus was talking to religious people. The numbers have to work. Assurance works when the numbers work. And we've just seen from our syllogism that even though we're good at sinning, he's good at saving, if you believe Jesus offers us for eternal life, I believe that, Lord. Therefore, I have eternal life. It's that simple. And can I say it's that hard? It's that hard, too. That's how hard it is. Sometimes it's too simple to not be hard. It's so simple it's difficult. That's the logic of assurance. We're going to talk about the emotion of assurance. We're going to talk about the things that you, in your life, that you, you let in that make you doubt. We're going to talk about scripture. We're going to talk about theologians that you hear and follow and some of their theological proclivities that, that lead them to saying that you can never be sure. But I want you to remember through this series one thing, that just as you being a father or a mother that would hear your child say they doubted your love, how it's like a knife to the heart, when we doubt God's love, it's like a knife to his heart. And we don't want to do that because we're good at sinning. And he's good at saving. Let's stand together. Father, thank you that you have provided in Jesus the means where we can have eternal life. The means where we go from death to life. And Father, I pray that um, if there's anything that we're believing in to get us to you other than Jesus, That, that, that you would just destroy that thing. That item, that idea, that thought that sets itself up against your gracious gift of Jesus, just obliterate it. And help us to see Jesus. Because Jesus is. He is. He's enough to give us new life and a life that lasts forever. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Hi, friends. I'm Olivia. I'm Rod. And you're listening to Just One More Thing from Sunrise Church. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Just One More Thing from Sunrise Church. In today's episode, we are covering the October 1st sermon titled The Logic of Assurance. And at lunch, uh, Cameron made the point that Assurance is so simple that you used a video clip of literal rocket science to explain it. Can you talk about your video clip for a bit? Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes we are assured because of the space we're in. And what I mean by that, the comfort of the space we're in, the familiarity of the space. If we were born Baptist and we're raised Baptist, uh, we're comfortable with that. We're, we're comfortable because we're comfortable. And in that video clip uh, from Hidden Figures, it's not the guys being comfortable with each other. It's they had to get comfortable with the numbers. And it did not matter where the source of those numbers came from. And Catherine, who uh, is a real-life person, this is a, based on a, a true story, uh, a black woman, ends up doing the math right there in front of them and uh For her to be in the room was very unique, and it wasn't because of her skin color. It was because she was a woman. This was all white men in a room talking about how they were going to get John Glenn back from being in space. And uh, she goes up there. She works the numbers, the math. And at the end, John Glenn says, I like your numbers. And he was basing his life on those numbers. The, the, The math had to work. And so with this message, I called it the logic of assurance because um, it it really doesn't matter what we're comfortable with or not comfortable with. What matters is the numbers. What matters is what Christ told us that we needed to do in order to have a forever home with him. And that was simply believe. We can try to add to that. We can try to take away from it. We can try to make it more complex than it is. But All he asks is that we simply believe him for his gift of eternal life. That's what I was trying to to get through. With with everything going on, it was the numbers that matter. With with everything that's going on, it's the gift that matters. So that's what I was trying to communicate. And I thought it was really helpful that you used those slides explaining the syllogisms, the assurance syllogism, and then you have the obvious syllogism. Yeah, I used the obvious one because people don't question that. People from almost every brand of Christianity, they know as a matter of logical sense that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. And the only problem with that is it's not biblical. Uh, Good people can go to hell and, and, and bad people can go to heaven because it's not based on the obvious syllogism. And and if you didn't watch the message or didn't hear the message uh, what I put up there was people have this idea, so Christians don't do something. So saved people or regenerated people, they don't sin or they don't, whatever your thing is, they don't do that. The next premise of that, I said, well, I do that. I, I sin. I, I miss the mark even now. And even if I was perfect after I came to Christ, there's no guarantee that I wouldn't at some other state, maybe further down the, the road, maybe two months from now, two years from now, that I wouldn't do that. Therefore, I must not be saved. If we use the works syllogism, then we will never be assured of our salvation. And so the assurance syllogism is quite simple. Jesus says, believe in me for eternal life. That is a truth. Jesus said that that I believe in him for eternal life, therefore I have eternal life. And it's that simple. And it's based on God's word. You either see Jesus as being trustworthy or you see him as not being trustworthy. And you also brought up a couple of the false syllogisms. You gave a couple of examples. Uh, for instance, you know, everyone baptized as a child is saved. I was baptized as a child, therefore I'm, I'm saved. Um, Which even that, if you think about it, oh, well, were you sprinkled or dunked? You know, there's always something when you add any sort of work to it, there's always going to be something of, oh, did you do it right? Did you do it the right way? So it's, I think it was 
very nice that you you put that up as an example because a lot of people think, oh, I, I'm part of this denomination, so I'm saved. But it's none of those things. The only scriptural basis is belief. That's plain it. And, plain and simple. You know, I think the most profound thing I said in the message uh, that I, I I could tell it when I was saying it, if you as a father will put in a, a one-way, up against a one-way glass, a one-way mirror, and your child was on the inside being interrogated, it would rip your heart apart if in their interrogation, if they said, my dad or my mom, they don't love me. My dad doesn't care about me. My, my dad, because of something I did, he doesn't want to have anything to do with me. You know, I, I would say a good 95% of parents out there, it would just rip their hearts out. And yet, somehow, we believe that when, when we aren't secure in our relationship with God, that God's okay with that. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. It, it, Jesus has promised us eternal life by simply believing in him. And when that's not good enough, it rips his heart out. Because like I said in the message, we're real good at sinning, and he's real good at saving. And I think that illustration was even more impactful because it wasn't just a hard and fast, like, oh, my parents don't love me. It was, I don't know if my parents love me, which I think that is even more gut-wrenching because how do they not know all the things that I've done? Exactly. How are they in doubt? How is there any confusion whatsoever? Whereas, I mean, yeah, hearing my, you know, my dad doesn't love me would obviously be difficult too, but there's something that has influenced that decision. Whereas the, I don't know, that's like a gray area that, you know, how, how do you not know? Exactly. And so I think that was the, the really impactful part for me, at least. Now, you you brought up an interesting um, point with Paul, because Paul writes in First Timothy, he talks about how Jesus came to save the sinners of whom I am the worst. And I think the emphasis should be on I am the worst, not I was the worst. And then he right. saved me like, glory, hallelujah, I'm, right. I'm no longer the worst. He says I am the worst. And I think your point there was very strong, especially as it relates to the obvious syllogism, because it was that, oh, the Apostle Paul, who we would all, you know, hail as, you know, the greatest missionary and such a great evangelist. He's saying I am the worst. Is Paul not saved? You know, as soon as you kind of add anything like that. Oh, the idea behind that is. Paul was comfortable in his sin. What I mean by that, what I mean by that is not Paul was comfortable sinning, but he knew he was a sinner. But that was okay because he knew Jesus is a Savior. And so uh, he was under no illusions. Uh, he got mad. He got angry. He got frustrated. Paul wasn't perfect after he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And I think what happens is we're uncomfortable in our sin. And someone told me this after the sermon. They said, you know, uh, we're uncomfortable in our sin, so we want to be uncomfortable in our salvation. So we'll stay on our toes, so we'll work at it and keep working at it. And, and we just need to know that, hey, yeah, we are uh, sinners, but we have a great Savior. And we have been brought into life. We we might die because of the, the sin of this world, meaning physically, and we might not with the rapture, I think, so close at hand. But um, he, he says, when you believe this, you will never die spiritually. And so, yes, we struggle with sin, but we acknowledge that, yeah, as long as we're in this flesh, we are sinners. It should magnify our understanding of how great a Savior he is. You know, I was re re reading this week um, about some of the early church. Some of my theology, it, it, it missed a lot of the early church, and specifically early church martyrs. And before Constantine, you know, there were some Roman emperors that, that went after the Christians, like, un unbelievably. And Christians were okay with dying for, for Jesus— because, and, and I never thought about this, this, this Catholic professor brought this up. He said, because that was a guarantee you could go to heaven. That's the way you could be assured of your salvation, by dying for Christ. Well, when they quit uh, killing Christians, well, how can you be assured at that point? If, if, if they're not coming after you to kill you, how can you be assured? So then they said, well, then you have to die to self. 
You have to, to deny yourself and live a selfless life, and that's the way. Well, as soon as you do that, you have just moved works into assurance. And in this series, I'm trying to make sure that works have nothing to do with assurance. You either believe Jesus' promise or you don't. And if you don't, that's on you because he's promised, and going back to what you said, how it would crush a father to know how could they not know. Jesus has promised you everything that you can know you have eternal life. As we looked at in John 5, they have moved from death to life. They have moved. They have made that move. Uh, it's a done deal. Fait accompli. It's, it's, it's over. We that believe Jesus for his gift, gift of eternal life, it's ours. So now step in it and live that. That's, that, that's the wonderful gift that he offers us. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think this is a great and necessary sermon series, and I hope that it's a huge encouragement to everyone. So thank you for breaking that down, and thank you all for listening to another episode of Just One More Thing from Sunrise Church. Sunrise Church.